Before we move on to the second uh, task we've finished, can we all uh, agree that that is that agreeable? Yeah, that's agreeable. Okay, good. Thank you, folks. Um, so, can we have uh, people's suggestions for a second task and finish group, please? Councillor Marshall. Thanks, Jay. I was just going to agree with Jill Quaid, which is we'll take the September meeting and see if that then picks out the fact that there needs to be a task and finish group for the low carbon and might happen to take that approach. So, I suppose we don't really want to get a second topic until we've at least got to September, but that could too much into the diary time. I'm happy that we've agreed one. So I think officers can then support and make progress in that. I think as long as there is a, a second topic that does emerge from the September meeting or from today, then we can certainly make progress. I think it's just if it drifts beyond that, um, the ability to then deliver the outcomes of those task and finish groups starts to be compromised. And I know that that's something that you're all very keen to do. And so we're just trying to facilitate the process much earlier than we've done in the past. Um, and, and, and make as much progress and get the outcomes from the task and finish that you wanted. In that case, I'll leave it to the September. If it's easier for the officers to, to, to do that webinar, we'll, we'll have to leave it to September. In that case, can I, to finish this item, can I ask if the recommendation to approve the formation of the task and finish brief and uh, to look into the LEP and its uh, economic uh, impact is agreed? Before we can completely finish that item, we also need to express a preference for the task and finish groups. Who for who is to sit in that task and finish group? So, does anyone have any nominees? Councillor Murphy, are you nominating yourself? Yeah, just volunteering. Thank you. Councillor Wainwright? Sure, yeah, I will get to as many as I can given my work commitments. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien? Thank you very much for that. Councillor Howard. I'll also put myself forward. Thank you. Fantastic. And Councillor Pugh as well. And Councillor fin Finnerin. I've got myself forward as well, please. I think that would be agreeable. Fantastic. So we have a task and finish group of Councillor Wainwright, Councillor Murphy, Councillor O'Brien, Councillor Howard, Councillor Finnerin, <coughs> and Councillor Pugh. Is that agreed? Thank you. Councillor <coughs> Murphy. To clarify, are we still having the workshop on this? I am informed that we can do that, so that will uh, be arranged as well. So that, that's good news. Okay. Um, Thank you for helping us get through all that business, folks. Um, now, please, can I invite Councillor Gillian Jill Wood, Deputy Portfolio Holder for Low Carbon and Renewable, Renewable Energy, to take us through her presentation. Right, I'm going to actually do the presentation from here, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I was going to say good morning, but now that we've reached the afternoon, and um, got a lot of business to go through. So I'm Deputy Portfolio Holder um, for Rob Powell-Hill, who leads on the Low Carbon Renewable Energy Portfolio for the Local City Region. Unfortunately, Rob couldn't be here today, so I've been asked to give a brief update, and I'm very conscious of time, so I am going to go through these slides fairly quickly, because I'm conscious that members and officers have other commitments and other meetings to get to. Um, this update is um, in addition to the full overview that was given to this committee back in April. Um, we've already got these slides, so therefore I'm going to talk through them, and if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. I've also got Mark Mills here, who's the Head of Energy and Low Carbon. Um, he'll be able to answer things in much greater depth, but given the time, I'm also thinking that if there's anything that you want to put in writing, maybe that might be the best way forward. I'm going to move on to this slide. I'm basically describing this as an energy audit for the Liverpool City region. It reflects, to the impact, it reflects the impact of energy on our communities and showing what is being spent on domestic fuel bills, network charges, business energy use, not including heavy industry for transportation, and also additional charges including climate levy. A striking figure here is at almost a billion, and that's the spend on petrol and diesel. 950 million equates to an awful lot of CO2, NOx, and particulates that we breathe in our air. 
can see the cost of road tax, local authority energy spend, and this is the figure for the six local authorities combined, and there's also the social cost of carbon. The slide also shows us that there's good news with 15% of the UK renewable energy capacity in our area, and however we have concerns, um, immediate concerns, with one in nine homes experiencing fuel poverty, and then also the quality of houses within the Liverpool city region, how energy efficient are they? Also of immediate concern is the fact that we're behind the curve with small scale projects such as solar installs, but these can be rectified. In November last year, Mayor Rodham and the Band Authority stated ambitions for, the, ambitions for the Liverpool city region to be zero carbon by 2040. The target of 2040 is clearly difficult, but feasible. This is due to the greater options that we have available to us in this area. We are also geographically blessed as a region. We have huge capacity in marine energy, such as offshore and tidal. We have the ability to create and use hydrogen. We are making sensible and serious commitments in order to achieve this target. The list before us gives us a pathway tapping into the already existing and emerging technologies. I'm not going to go read them through, you can actually read them for yourself. But this list, it's a full and comprehensive list, but it's not an a la carte menu. In order for us to achieve the targets that we've set in place, we need to do everything on this list. Does everyone have time to read through that or do you want me to keep it there for a little bit longer? Hydrogen. Why is hydrogen important to the Liverpool City region? We've got a long history of hydrogen production here. It's already here, it's been here for quite a few decades, um, over 40 years, I believe. We've already got large scale hydrogen production happening in the region. We've already got the assets in the ground and in production. And just as an illustration, we have enough available hydrogen today that we could use to service the Liverpool City region bus fleet. We've got expertise across the board in companies, universities, regulators, and in government. Hydrogen production supply and use within the Liverpool city region will be as much about harvesting our brain power as well as our infrastructure. We've got the ability to scale and mainstream the projects and this will be critical. For example, if we're going to say replace natural gas with hydrogen, then it needs to be a reliable source of energy and we do know how to do that. And that's by scaling up the production and supply. We want to see our homes converted to hydrogen, fossil fuels in the future will not be an option for us and that's why it's so important to get this all in place and scaled up. If we look at offshore wind and, the use, and, and use that as a recent reference point, we are world leaders in this area. Offshore wind is the source for hydrogen energy creation, allowing for clean, electrolyzing hydrogen production. Already we have 140 companies involved in the offshore wind supply and this sees us exporting our expertise and knowledge worldwide. The map before you, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. It shows us the Liverpool to Manchester hydrogen cluster. It's a low-cost low deliverable project. It clearly illustrates how, how power, such as offshore wind, will act as a reliable source for energy for hydrogen production. Hydrogen will bring us clean energy for domestic supply, for industry, for transportation. Hydrogen is a big part of the solution, an answer to the future of energy creation and also addressing the issues around climate change. Hydrogen production facilities in our area. We've already got world leaders in operation in this region, such as BOC and Innova, with others looking to join them. We are the only place in the UK with existing hydrogen, pipe, hydrogen production facilities with pipelines that we can tap into. Both plants have got capacity for us today. Therefore, this will make both, make both plants more efficient in terms of production, which will see them more likely to survive, which is good for jobs and the economy. BOC, are based in St. Helens, producing hydrogen for Pilkington and they have spare capacity. Therefore, it is less cost effective. At the moment, it's less cost effective, but we can tap into that and use the, um, the spare capacity that they've got. We've also got Innova, and they are based in Halton and they're producing chlorine, and the byproduct or the waste product of that is hydrogen, which could be used for our, um, our energy solutions. The Liverpool City region is home to leading hydrogen transport solutions as well. 
there are jobs in this, both in protecting, in protecting existing industries such as BOC and Innovum, but it also creates new markets for us. We have Onco based in Aintree and they make hydrogen hybrid trucks such as the one that you can see in the photograph of the waste wagon. Um, this is a, an SME startup company, but we've also got Alstrom, who are based in Widnes, and Alstrom are just about to go into production with the Breeze train powered by hydrogen. The Breeze should be rolled out in, and in operation in the UK by the end of 2020. Alstrom is, is a, clo a global scale company, and both Ormaco as an SME and Alstrom are important for our area. They see our region best placed at the centre of hydrogen transportation, and this in turn brings wider political support. The Full City Region Hydrogen Project Pipeline. We've got Arcola Energy, the We've got Arcola Energy, a leading specialist in hydrogen and fuel cells technologies, a company that has recently decided to move out of London and base itself, setting up a factory in Hyden. We have Project Centurion, the world's biggest electrolyzing facility based in Nuncorn, taking the energy created from offshore wind farms in order to produce <coughs> hydrogen. The two pictures show firstly one of the hydrogen buses that will be on our roads hopefully by next year. And then the other picture shows us the new fuel stack, which is based out at Innovum. And these projects bring together the boroughs in our region, building on the commitment made by Mayor Rotherham to see no boroughs left behind. Mersey Tidal. It's definitely the star of the show with regard to what's happening for energy production in this area. Um, I believe the Overview and Scrutiny Committee had a, present, a, de a detailed presentation of this in April, but the business case for Tidal is due back next year. Tidal at the moment, there are two things that we can be assured of, it's predictability and also it's, it's clean energy. Therefore, there are significant volumes of energy that will be available to us. It is a big part of the solution to energy, energy and climate change. Tidal is a part of the portfolio of solutions sitting alongside solar and wind. Work done in this field builds on what has been happening over the past five years. A lot of the technology involved transfers from offshore and port development. Also, we have built up a reputation as being a place that can deliver large-scale projects. Examples being Burbo Bank, Mersey Gateway, Liverpool 2 Container Port. The investment community is taking us seriously because we can deliver these large-scale projects. We have experience across ex expertise and experience at crossover such as planners, consultants, technical providers. The Liverpool City region is a good place to be. With regard to plans to, for development, there is much on this report to, to, be, to be reported on in the future. The outline business case will help inform us as we explore the viability of large-scale projects and the outline business case will look at the strategic, economic, financial and commercial and management, management aspects of projects. This is quite a bit of a dry slide. Um, I'll leave it up there if you want to keep looking at that for a moment. So, in summary, lessons we are learning. Pilots that have been in place have shown us that how, how we do stuff. We need to start moving away from the small scale and we need to roll out projects because the benefits are enormous. Basically, this is the future. We need to get on and do it now, regardless of the challenges that we may face, for the benefits are so great, whether that be increasing future jobs, technologies, infrastructure, and of course tackling the challenges that, we've, that climate, change, climate change brings us. So, in moving back to a slide that was shown earlier, the world's ambitious, green, fair, connected and together is essential to everything that we do in the Liverpool City region. We need to be mindful that if in everything we need to be mindful of that in everything that we do. We must take communities with us and explain to businesses and residents, residents why this matters and how this will benefit them. We must deliver the ability to engage with communities because this is the future and low carbon energy is the future. Right, I'm just going to end it there. I rattled through it, so apologies for me slipping up a little bit. If you've got any questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, and say Mark could actually come in and um, step in and give me some further detail and help with your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Councillor, and thank you for your patience hanging on until now. Um, do members have any questions of Councillor Pugh? 
Can I thank you for that presentation, which was um, I think was quite sort of visionary, really, and I'm a massive fan of uh, hydrogen uh, and tidal power, hydrogen particularly, because when people talk about using electricity as a fuel, they fail to put into the equation how that electricity is actually produced, which may be from carbon sources, and hydrogen is a very, very clean fuel. But the problem with visionaries, and also scale of the ambition, is that sometimes, you know, one doesn't meet one's ambitions, and the visions sometimes <coughs> vanish. Even from the glorious day when the government changes, um, you know, we may not find we can do all we want to do. And I think you're aware, probably, that uh, there are financial, practical, social, and technical hurdles to get over. And we've been here before with tidal barrage, the project, you know, decades ago that went to a certain stage and then failed. So what I noticed about the presentation, and I don't know whether it was deliberate, is it was stripped of really short-term targets or medium-term targets for rollout. The vision was there, but there weren't any dates at which certain things ought to happen if that vision is to be achieved. So I just wonder whether you had put any thought into putting measurable targets for rollouts of specific things. Um, so that's my first question. The second question, more than more mundane, um, about air quality, um, I'm aware it's an issue for all of us. Uh, I'm also aware that our, the provision for actually monitoring air quality across Merseyside is not fantastic. We monitor traffic movements, but traffic movements aren't the same as air quality and don't necessarily correlate evenly with them. Is there any thinking to provide um, let's say a better capacity to measure, but for truly professional air quality measurement, so that we can identify the really difficult areas that we don't already know them and maybe surprise ourselves with some of the evidence that we obtain. So um, two questions really. Um, are there measurable dates, uh, so are there other you know, targets, I don't use the word targets really, but sort of uh, milestones that you're looking at where you hope to achieve some of this? And secondly, are we going to increase the provision for uh, quality measurement? I'm going to ask Mark to step in for some of it and also with regard to the air quality it can kind of fits within to the transport portfolio so Liam might actually be best place to answer that, answer that question although there is crossover as with anything um, I think that Liam will be best place for that. With regard to rollout targets are you specifically dealing with tidal or because Well if I can be specific I mean the, the hydrogen is a very very exciting uh, fuel to use and you can obviously do it as a proof of concept you have to be pilots but nobody's yet reached a point where they can roll it out on cross fleets and things like that, at least I'm not that aware. Um, and clearly, if that's our ambition, there must be some point at which we can see that ambition on the cusp of being achieved, or we can see it receding away from us for one reason or another. And, uh, you know, what I don't want, or what I should avoid, or should avoid, is the sketch of a vision, which then vanishes at some point in time, because we haven't really put in appropriate milestones in which we want to see the vision or bits of the vision, or part of the vision. Uh, I suppose we're asking for more medium, uh, achievable, short-term targets in the, in the scheme. With regard to targets, I mean, the, the tidal, the, the, the business case will be prepared and be ready for next year, and that's going forward. Um, targets with regard to hydrogen, we will have a fleet of buses on our roads within the next year. The Breeze train will be in operation by the end of 2020. Um, but there is, to me, there's no, there is no option with it. We have to move forward with this, and we, we, we have. It, it, it's not a matter that it's going to fall by the wayside. It has to happen. Um, you know, fossil fuels. Can, we cannot continue to go on as the way we are. There are lots of small scale projects, as I said, within the, 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 the pack that are in place. What we need to do is scale that up and, and then make it mainstream. Whether that's actually putting energy within homes and changing people's gas supply. These things have to happen. I'm just going to defer that over to Mark with regard to whether he's got any fixed dates. I'm not too sure. Is that okay with you, Mark? Thank you. There are um, fixed dates for all the projects we've described. Um, so there are in hydrogen, there are six principal projects that are working at the moment. Um, all of those projects are underway at the moment. Uh, first delivery of projects will come in from May of next year, which is the hydrogen bus fleet, which is this 25 bus is the first hydrogen refueling station, public refueling station in the north of England, which will open St Helens, um, and hydrogen production plant from that. Other projects then include the first deployment of hydrogen into the gas group, um, 
and that again is a world's first. Uh, we expect subject to regulatory approval, first home to be uh, the start of the conversion by this time next year, so by mid-2020. So to take the point that a lot of this is seen in esoteric for a long time, but actually we've got deliverable dates on these projects now across the board. Same over time, we have a timeline, and again, I think we all take this point, and we'll share these dates with, um, with the committee as well. Um, both in terms of delivery of the, of the business case, but then obviously moving that forward to a final potential date for, for opening and generation. Um, similarly with offshore wind, but so, so we have a, a very detailed timetable that we're working from this, which again is about hitting these targets as soon as possible. Um, some of these projects are big infrastructure projects and have a long, long time to, to develop and build out, uh, but equally importantly is getting change on the ground as soon as possible. Their quality question. Um, yeah, because that's a very good point. I chair the air quality task force that you recommended we, we set up. Um, you're absolutely right, John, that the kind of uh, the quality of our monetary stations for a whole host of not least sort of, uh, financial cuts, is not as comprehensive as it should be. Uh, it is one of those things we are looking at as part of the task force, particularly looking at some of the uh, very good work that both Sefton and Liverpool particularly are doing because. As part of the task force, we're actually looking at how we can roll out best practice. So that is something we're investigating and we'll bring back further up there to some things to develop. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Thank you. So I agree, some really interesting large scale, long term projects. Um, yes, on esoteric in many ways. One small issue that may not be life changing, world changing. Are you looking to any work around? ice cream vans with their engines idling, children queuing by the ice cream van, and the air quality whilst the engine just ticks over, whilst they stand by the exhaust. Any that you share that might help me with some questions I'm receiving? Well, just looking at this from being a, a world councillor, and uh, you've been one of my colleagues over there, is that, yeah, ice cream vans, it's a big issue. For me, I, I, it, it's one of those things that I want to see change. It's part of that whole mix with regard to changing how we operate. I mean, we can't carry on burning fossil fuels. We can't carry on with diesel vehicles. We just cannot do that. Everything has to change. With regard to any policy that's in there, I think that I've been dealing with some of the councillors and some of the officers over in Wirral with regard to looking at local policy, how that will map out over the Liverpool city region. I'm not too sure yet. And I need to liaise with Rob Polker. Um, I'm also thinking with regard to lean, with regard to the uh, quality side of that. Could you just expand, sorry, I do apologise to say the rest of the question. Sorry, I am wondering if they are slightly more advanced on the air quality issues and could share any of their learnings on any kind of studies on any of these engines I do, but particularly where children are queuing. I'm actually going to hand over to Mark on it as well on this because I can see here. Yeah, sorry, Mark. Um, yeah, question on screen yeah. um, We are actually, strangely enough, uh, one of the companies that was mentioned, Yolanco, uh, the people that are producing diesel hydrogen hybrid trucks, um, have, have actually now got a product um, which are um, small scale vans, uh, van products, uh, specifically designed for areas where you've got long duty cycles of the vehicles, because the vehicles are standing, so they, they've been powered, the freezers and the generators have been powered obviously from the diesel engine, so they're sitting there idling for hours at a time. Um, and this is where we see the, the use of fuel cell uh, will enable you to be able to switch the diesel engine off in effect. Um, so to run those vehicles um, at zero emission while they're actually serving customers. So that is being thought of. It's not just on, um, on our screen bands, it's a whole range of duty cycle vehicles where we've got that do small scale multi drops. Um, so whether it's delivery bands um, and also municipal vehicles as well, we're all being considered in this. Thank you. Sorry, is there just anything you could share with me? I can share with the Friends of the Urban Head Park Group in particular. Thank you, Councillor Wolfall, and then Councillor Marshall. Right. right, thanks for the presentation, Joe. There's uh, just a couple of points I'd like to make. One is an agreement with uh, Dr. Pugh on the the production of hydrogen, I do believe hydrogen 
really as the future. Unfortunately, I won't be around to see it because I think in 30, 40 years' time, I think most energy will be, in fact, produced through hydrogen. But one thing I am concerned about, we were given a presentation a couple of months ago regarding the Mersey Tidal System. I, I, the guy who gave the presentation wasn't quite sure at that time where we were actually going with it, and what sort of method you know, were we going to use to, to produce the energy. What I am concerned about is where, in fact, will it leave upstream of the river? I know there's, there's certain different methods of producing uh, energy from the tide. But I get the impression, no matter what it is, there could, in fact, be more of a forming of a lake upstream of the river. Now, if that is, because plankton and other uh, I'm not saying sea creatures, but it might, it might uh, biological things getting through, but may not be able to, to come back. Do we, have we actually done a study on the, the possible consequences on the ecology of the river based upstream from the, where it's uh, the tidal things are going to go, I say things, because we're not quite sure at the moment what it's going to be. But once we've decided, do we not need to make sure that we do an ecology study to make sure upstream is not going to be damaged in any way? As far as I'm aware with regard to Tidal, is that everything involved in it will look at not just the business case, the energy case, it will look at the ecology as well, is it has to do all those things, no matter what decisions are made as how we move forward. There's a lot of work going into that at the moment, um, and <coughs> that will be fed back and will be fed back, fed back through the committee and come through to the CA. But until that business case and everything is actually written down and put in place, is that I'm, 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 I'm not able to share that information with regard to the ecology side, yes, studies have been done in the past, but that was specifically looking looking back a few years back um, at the um, barrage, but they, and it was deemed not to be the sensible way forward on, on an ecological side. But I don't know whether, once again, I do apologise, Mark, whether you want to come back in on that. Yeah, just just on that, Joe, I'm adding an additional one out, I'm sorry. The, are we aware of any examples in the whole of the country? where they've already got uh, tidal energy, whether it's in fact cost effective. And we're talking about 120 years. You're talking very much, not much shorter than the life of coal. Technology is moving on so quickly. I think it could in fact, the tidal one could in fact be out of date in 30, 40, 50 years down. Um, just to confirm, the environmental um, management systems are a fundamental part of the work we're doing at the moment to create the business case. Um, so there are specialist consultants who have been appointed to do that work, looking at all options, it is fundamental to make this work. Um, we need to be able to create a, a type of scheme that is both commercially viable, investable, but fundamentally um, is environmentally responsible. So it is being, the work is being done at the moment and that will be part, fundamental part of the business case that's brought back to the CA next year. Um, just on the, on the technology, um, an issue that we've all got to face in infrastructure at the moment is that technology is moving on at such a pace um, that there is a danger, see, a danger in transport and energy of redundancy. Um, so that, again, has been picked up as part of the work that we're doing at the moment is to understand. So it's concepts like modularisation. So you might want to be able to swap turbines out of the system earlier than the, the engineered design life on it. So those kind of areas are being thought through at the moment to make sure that there is, you know, there, there is no issues about redundancy on, on technology. Just to pick up the point about the fact that it, it's moved forward, it has, but with time, it is there constantly. It is one of the few sources of energy that we know will be there constantly. Um, but, you know, so with, with that sense, it has a long design life, simply because the structure that we, that we will put in place has that kind of design life. But we are picking up, A, the issue about redundancy, and also 
the issue about climate change as well, because obviously we will expect to see greater sea level, um, sea rises and volatile weather conditions. So again, that thinking has been built into the work that we've done at the moment. Uh, Councillor Marshall. Thanks, Chair. Um, just two commentary. Um, previous approaches, I think, to barrages and that probably didn't have the same impetus that they currently have in the fact that obviously the planet is quite literally on fire in certain areas and we don't have a massive amount of time to keep kicking it down the road. Um, we have got a climate emergency. Thanks, Gillian Mark and Liam, um, for your comments around um, with deliverables for the 2020. Um, and if you could please share the info about the ice cream vans with those who've got similar issues, obviously, on the beach. Um, it's uh, areas of Sefton, um, <coughs> that have been raised by our residents in our ward. Just a point to note on the very first slide, which is about the costs and things like that, just on some dirty calculations, the £950 million that's spent on petrol and diesel, actually £617 million of that is tax, government's tax, so fuel duty, all that. Um, and if that's just the northwest region, it's going to leave a massive hole in the coffers, and I'm interested to uh, see what our national government would do with that. Okay, I think unless there are any absolutely urgent questions, we could probably um, thank, um, thank Councillor Wood for, for that presentation, if that's okay with everybody. Yes. And, um, yes, yeah, so Jill would just like to say a word. Just to note that um, the last item we were in fact in court <coughs> for that last item um, on this occasion. So that, that means we'll do what we've done in the past when we've got to this situation where um, you, you, you've not formally noted the report, but we'll just document that uh, what's occurred today, um, just to bring that to your attention. So. Okay, so that concludes today's meeting. Thank you all very much. The next meeting is Wednesday the 4th of September.